the fifth estate. Every year in the United States and Canada, a small band of investigators marks the anniversary of John Fitzgerald Kennedy's assassination. They share a belief, held by most Americans incidentally, that the 35th president of the United States was not simply the victim of a single crazed gunman, Lee Harvey Oswald. For 22 years, through diligent private research, they've kept alive the question of who killed JFK. Many are experts in fields ranging from pathology to photoanalysis, and every new year they slot in another piece of the puzzle. Tonight we go back, as we did two years ago, to examine this fascinating labyrinth of clues that will probably keep alive forever the mystery of John Fitzgerald Kennedy's death. On a spit of land jutting into Boston Bay, the JFK Library. It conjures up the Kennedy presidency's image of gleam and glory. Within the walls are the private papers and White House tape recordings from the Kennedy administration. Most of the material is still secret, but one day Kennedy's own words might yield the best clues to the mystery that persists about his death. What was he saying in private about Cuba or Vietnam? Who did he think was out to get him? In assassination, there's an ancient question. Qui bono? Who benefited from the murder? Those most skeptical about the official findings focus on three groups with motive, means, and opportunity. The mafia, the military, and the intelligence agencies. Kennedy was at odds with all of them. The president's brother, Robert Kennedy, then attorney general, was haunted by the possibility of a conspiracy. Right after the murder, he called the director of the Central Intelligence Agency and asked bluntly whether any CIA people were part of it. Robert Kennedy also suspected the Mafia, perhaps retaliating for the Kennedy brothers' relentless war on organized crime. When Robert Kennedy himself ran for the presidential nomination, he made clear he would have pursued the unanswered questions. Press Secretary Frank Mankiewicz. Out in California during the campaign in 1968, he was asked a question at a student meeting out in San Fernando Valley if he were elected president, if he would order the files open, and he said yes, he would. That was an interesting answer. He, he knew what that question was about. A week after that answer, Robert Kennedy was himself murdered, and the files in the CIA, the Pentagon, and the FBI have for the most part remained closed. So the task of keeping the flame of an unofficial investigation flickering has been taken over by about 150 amateur sleuths across the U.S. and Canada. Some chase bizarre theories. We went through... Others, like these Washington lawyers, track the case through government files, using the Freedom of Information Act to pry loose clues. I could determine whether they were or were not a value. Bernard Fensterwald is an independently wealthy Washington attorney who has filed more than 500 Freedom of Information Act suits on the assassination. Canada and in the United States in the year 1963. Where do you get the determination to keep going as many years as you have? Well, well I guess one of the reasons is I went to school with John Kennedy, and he was a friend of mine, and at the time of his death, uh, I was a counsel to a Senate committee, and we mainly did investigations, and when I read the Warren report, I thought this thing is just phony from beginning to end. And then I read the 26 volumes of evidence and was more convinced that it was phony. And uh, this whole matter of solving a thing like this is for people working on the same piece of the puzzle to cooperate. The three or four people I work very closely with, and we never get a piece of information that we do not Xerox it, pass it around, because uh, occasionally our files get rifled, and we would not want a valuable piece of information to be in the files of just one person. Your files got rifled? Yes, they have been at times. By whom? Well, if we could answer that question, maybe we could answer a lot of others. Maybe it was a cleaning lady. Maybe you're just paranoid. Uh, well, in one case, the uh, glass door in the uh, office wasn't in this particular office. It was smashed and the door was opened and several file cabinets had been gone through. You believe that somebody doesn't want you to find out what happened? Well, I know there are a lot of people who don't want us to find out the answer. Uh, when we have to show up uh, at a hearing on a Freedom of Information case, there may be as many as eight government lawyers there. 
which is just sort of absurd. And we spend hours and days and weeks in court trying to get documents that are 20 years old and uh, relate to a lone nut killer. But all these are high national security matters. Friday morning, 11.37. The president's jet lands at the Dallas airport. Love Field. The warm welcome at Dallas's Love Field in the late morning of November 22nd masked the hatred many here felt for Kennedy. That morning, full-page newspaper ads accused him of treason. Oil men felt threatened by his plan to sock them with higher taxes. The ultra-right-wing John Birch Society, which counted the mayor of Dallas among its open supporters, accused him of going soft on Cuba and selling out to the Russians. Anti-Castro Cubans seethed at his promise never to invade Cuba. In Miami, two weeks before, a right-wing extremist was taped by a police informant. Joseph Miltier described how John Kennedy would be shot with a high-powered rifle from an office building window. He predicted that a patsy would be arrested soon after to throw everyone off the track. Miami police informed the president's secret service about the threat, but the field agents responsible for this motorcade were never told. As the limousine carrying the Kennedys, along with Texas Governor John Connolly and his wife, made the fateful turn into Dealey Plaza, professionals saw unpardonable security lapses. Windows were open, and there were other obvious hideouts for gunmen which had not been sealed off. As the motorcade turned, shots came from the Texas School Book Depository, fired as the Warren Commission found by Lee Harvey Oswald. That official judgment on the assassination said Oswald was a nut who acted alone. But in front of the president's car is what has become known as the Grassy Knoll, a little hill with a picket fence behind it. Most of the people who were on the knoll that day dived for cover because they thought they heard shots from behind them. And if they're correct, more than one gunman was involved. Kennedy would have been killed in a crossfire the result of an organized conspiracy. There's numerous people running up the hill alongside Elm Street, there by the Simmons Freeway. Several police officers are rushing up the hill at this time. We heard the first shot in the press. Korean War veteran William Newman was with his family on the knoll that day. I thought it scared him. And then as the car got directly in front of us, well, a gunshot apparently from behind us hit the person in the side, side of the temple, uh, apparently back up on the uh, knoll. S.M. Holland was further along, on an overpass in front of the president's car. Well, I was standing right up against the banister on top of the triple underpass where you're looking right down their throat, you might say. And actually, I had my eye on the president's car. The third shot came from the fence, and there was a puff of smoke that kind of lingered out uh, under the green trees right out from that picket fence about eight or nine feet off the ground. But the official government judgment discarded these eyewitness accounts and claimed that Kennedy was killed by three shots from this $13 rifle found in the depository with three spent shells beside it. The Dallas police report said two shells, but when the report was reproduced in the Warren Commission, the number two was changed to three without explanation. Within an hour of the shooting, Dallas police astonished the world with their efficiency by dragging their suspect from the movie theater and whisking him to police headquarters. No record was kept of Oswald's repeated interrogations except what television recorded. Against the wall. All right, these, these people have given me a hearing without legal representation or anything. Can you shoot the president? I didn't shoot anybody, no, sir. Then two days later, Oswald came down this elevator, surrounded by Dallas police. Dozens of whom were chummy with a nightclub owner and small-time mobster named Jack Ruby. Ruby was waiting on the other side of the door. A later investigation concluded Ruby had stalked Oswald in the police station all weekend before finally making his move. There's a shot. There's a 
Oswald has been shot. Ruby would first say he was crazed with grief. Oswald has been shot. Chief Justice Earl Warren headed the official inquiry into the assassination, and then Congressman Gerald Ford served on the commission. I think the Warren Commission did a very thorough job in investigating the assassination of uh, President Kennedy, and I firmly believe today, as I did then, and it was a unanimous decision, that our basic conclusions were right. Number one, that Lee Harvey Oswald uh, committed the assassination, and number two, the commission found no evidence of a conspiracy, foreign or domestic. As reenacted in this FBI simulation, the commission claimed that Oswald, a poor marksman, somehow fired three bullets in an astonishing 5.6 seconds, hitting both Kennedy and Connolly with one of the shots. This bullet, same ammunition, it looks like a wider piece of ammunition, but it's the same, went through the carcass of a goat, striking one rib and a goat's chest. Forensic pathologist Cyril Wecht sums up the critic's case against the one bullet theory. This bullet went through the wrist of a human cadaver, breaking the distal end of the radius in the same fashion that that bone was broken in Governor John Conley. 399, the hero of the Warren Commission report, the bullet which broke both a rib and the radius in John Conley is in pristine condition, except for minimal deformity at the base is virginal in its condition. The single bullet theory says that one bullet struck the president in the back, coursed through his upper chest, exited from the front of his neck, re-entered John Conley's back, pierced the right lung, collapsing it, severed a vein, artery, and nerve, broke the right fifth rib, destroying five inches of that bone, exited from the front of the governor's right chest, re-entered the back of the governor's right forearm, caused a comminuted fracture of the distal end of the radius, a very thick bone, partially severed a vein, artery, and nerve, exited from the front of the governor's right wrist, re-entered the governor's left thigh, went all the way down to the femur, the big bone in the thigh, bounced back, came out through the same small hole in the skin, fell into the governor's clothing, from his clothing onto the stretcher, and was fortuitously found a few hours later in the afternoon on Friday, November 22nd, 1963, at Parkland Memorial Hospital by a maintenance employee who was trying to get to the men's room and found a corridor blocked by stretchers. Now that is the single bullet theory. More aptly, and descriptively entitled by the Warren Commission critics as the magic bullet theory. But it was photoanalyst Robert Groden who was instrumental in forcing a reopening of the case. His enhancement of the home movie film shot by Abraham Zapruder was shown on national TV for the first time in 1975. It showed Kennedy being blown backward by the fatal headshot. This pointed to a second gunman in front, and from that, a conspiracy. These crucial frames, when printed in the Warren Commission, had been transposed to show Kennedy thrown forward instead of backward. When critics pointed this out to the FBI, Director Hoover said it was a printing mistake. In 1976, with the support of the Kennedy clan, Congress set up a committee of the House of Representatives to reopen the case. Congressman Christopher Dodd believes the Warren Commission skimmed over contradictory evidence. Uh, the Warren Commission was under tremendous pressure uh, to conduct an investigation to confirm that Lee Harvey Oswald was the lone assassin. Uh, President Johnson was in an election year. He didn't want to have, uh, this is a, a campaign issue in 1964. Chief Justice Warren didn't even want to serve on the commission to begin with. And he wanted uh, that committee to wrap up its work in, 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 as quickly as possible. The, the emotional level was extremely high, not just in this country, but throughout the world. The committee had had enough of conspiracy theories when suddenly their own experts came up with startling new evidence. Minutes before the killing, a police motorcycle radio had been held open by a jammed button. We can't hear anything. And the sounds it picked up were automatically recorded at police headquarters. Two groups of sound experts analyzed the tape. The results of the analyses themselves convinced us it appears that with a probability of 95% or better, there was indeed a shot fired from the grassy knoll. Robert Groden synchronized the shooting sounds with the Zapruder film. 
The first shots now came too close together to have come from Oswald's gun alone. The last shots were almost simultaneous and echoed differently. But despite the head snap backwards, the committee still concluded that any shot from the grassy knoll must have missed. The reason was the autopsy report. The examination of Kennedy's body showed that he could not have been hit from the front. This would become even more important later. A new scientific panel attacks the committee's analysis of the motorcycle tape, saying there's no evidence of a grassy knoll shot. However, Richard Billings, a former Life magazine editor who was on the committee's staff, says the evidence of a conspiracy goes deeper than that, and it points to the Mafia. The main piece of evidence of, of organized crime complicity in the conspiracy is Jack Ruby. If you're going to decide the final answer of this crime, the murder of the president, Oswald's not around to go on trial, nor is Ruby now, but he was. The character of Ruby is crucial. He, he was much more deeply involved in the mob than He was totally realized. involved in the mob. He was not involved in anything else, ever. He was born in Chicago from the time he was 11 years old. Walking, when he got out in the streets of Chicago, he was, uh, he was working for mobsters. He was a runner for Al Capone, messenger boy when he, when he was a kid. He... he worked for the mob in Chicago. For, he was a labor goon. When the mob from Chicago went into Dallas and, and took over in 1947, he was involved in that. Uh, really was nothing else but mob. See that hat start to move now. Shortly after the assassination, a New York mobster said the killing of Oswald bore all the marks of a mafia hit, the kind frequently ordered to silence a paid killer or a patsy after he has done his job. Even Ruby's style was gangland, approaching the victim quickly, jamming the gun into his stomach, and blasting away. While being taken back to his cell today, reporters tried to talk with Ruby. How's it going, Jack? I'm not supposed to be insane. I'm supposed to be insane, rather. I can't answer you. I'm supposed to be insane. I can't answer you intelligently. When the Warren Commission came to Dallas, Ruby offered to tell all if only he could be taken out of the hands of the Dallas police and brought to Washington to testify. The commission refused, but in letters to his friends and family before he died in 1967, Ruby maintained that he was part of a larger plot. Do you think it'll ever come out? No, because... Once, in public, he admitted conspiracy. The, uh, the people had, that had so much to gain and, and had such a material motive for putting me in a position I'm in will never let the true facts come of their boards to the, to the world. Are these people in very high positions, Jack? Yes. The Fifth Estate returns in... After the Congressional Committee's final report in 1979, concluding there had been a conspiracy, the Chief Counsel Robert Blakey joined with Billings to write a more detailed count of the alleged Mafia complicity. We know the motive. The motive was that Bob Kennedy was determined to wipe them out, and the statistics show that he was being successful. Uh, and we know that... But then why not shoot, shoot Bobby because, Kennedy? Why do you shoot uh, the because, president? Because uh, it's told in New Orleans uh, when, when the leading mafia figure there is asked, uh, what are you going to do about the attorney general? And, uh, and the, the conversation gets around, well, you don't, you don't kill the attorney general. You've got to kill the president. And he tells this little parable about if your dog is biting you, uh, you don't cut off his tail, you cut off his head. The idea being that if they shot the Attorney General, the President would have come after him with the Army, the Navy, the Marine Corps. So, so the way to stop the Attorney General, and they did effectively, uh, uh, history shows, was to kill the President. Carlos Marcello, a syndicate chief in New Orleans, had been deported by Robert Kennedy. 
He made it back into the country, but a witness told the FBI Marcello had sworn later that not only would the head be cut off the dog, but a nut would be blamed for the crime. Teamster boss Jimmy Hoffa, hounded by Bobby Kennedy for his mafia ties, also was recorded by the FBI threatening the Kennedys. After the president was murdered, Bobby asked how Hoffa had taken the news. He was told of the jubilation at Teamster headquarters. Santos Traficante. The Congressional Committee found that as head of the Havana underworld before Castro took power, Traficante had links to one Jack Ruby. Alamon, you solemnly swear the evidence you're about to give this... Jose Alamon, a Traficante associate, testified about a conversation he had with the Mafia leader shortly before the assassination. With his back guarded by U.S. Marshals, Alamon told the committee that Traficante had cursed the way Kennedy was pursuing Hoffa. Well, he said, uh, Jose, he's not going to be reelected. You don't understand me. He's going to be hit. President Kennedy was going to get hit. Did you ever make that statement? Sir, we've already... Traficante denied the murderous prophecy. Later, a terrified Alleman said perhaps Traficante meant Kennedy would be hit by votes. But despite his war on the mob, Jack Kennedy had as one of his most intimate associates, a woman who shared her time with gangsters. Richard Billings from the Congressional Committee. In fact, Jack Kennedy uh, was corrupted by the mob. And this... Uh, How? He was corrupted when, in, during the election campaign, he was out in Las Vegas and was introduced by Frank Sinatra to, to Judith Campbell, who divorced... Uh, aspiring movie actress. They would meet in New York or Palm Beach or here in Washington, right here in the White House. And, and uh, it was, uh, you know, their meetings were quick sexual encounters and she'd take off and probably unbeknownst to Kennedy while he was doing this, uh, Judith Campbell was also uh, a sometime girlfriend of Sam Giancana who was probably one of the very top mafia leaders uh, out of Chicago. I can, at this time, emphatically state that my relationship with Jack Kennedy was of a close personal nature and did not involve conspiratorial shenanigans of any kind. I originally met Jack Kennedy in early February 1960 in Las Vegas. We were introduced by a mutual friend. Judith Exner said her relationship with John Kennedy ended in 1962. She would not say why. She said they had met many times over a two-year period, including meetings at the White House. Many times. What would you do when you went there? I would have lunch with Jack Kennedy. Alone? I won't go into this. Did you ever meet Mrs. Kennedy? No. Billings says that the mob leaves an honest politician alone, the ones who, who but one who has been compromised is fair game. Feel, the mob feels that... Uh, once a politician takes their money or takes their favors, uh, and certainly a Or their woman, girlfriend. Their girlfriend, that's a favor. Uh, he's kind of put themselves, himself on their level. And, and that, makes him, that makes him vulnerable. And I don't think this is, uh, this is facetious. I think this is really the way they thought. Uh, Jack Kennedy, by, by doing what he did, unwittingly or not, was... Uh, was stooping to their level and making himself vulnerable. And then he betrayed them. Well, he he had betrayed them before he, while he was seeing Judith Campbell, his brother was going after the mob, which they considered betrayal. And then, yeah, when he found out who she was, he, he cut her off because uh, he was smart enough to know that he couldn't. He couldn't be seeing her and, and, and support Bobby at the same time. What the Kennedy brothers did not know is that the mob believed that their administration had been compromised in another way. Mafia leaders Johnny Roselli and Sam Giancana had been recruited along with Traficante in a plan to kill Fidel Castro. Recruited by none other than the Central Intelligence Agency. Chief Counsel for the Congressional Committee, Robert Blakey. Traficante was to arrange to get poison pills into Cuba 
which were to be put in Castro's food. Attempts have been made to pin the Castro plot on the Kennedys, but the CIA denies this. In fact, congressional testimony revealed that Bobby Kennedy went into a cold rage when he heard about the conspiracy to kill Castro and ordered it stopped. But from a mobster's point of view, they were doing favors for the administration, and in return, the Kennedys were trying to wipe them out. Certain countries have uh, characteristics... But what uh, could uh, Lee Harvey Oswald possibly have to do with the Mafia? He had earlier defected to the Soviet Union, and in New Orleans, after he returned to the U.S., defended Castro's Cuba. In your work with the Fair Play for Cuba committee, uh, what are you advocating? His politics might have been radically different from those of New Orleans Mafia leader Marcello, but they shared some connections who might have been assigned to recruit a dupe for the assassination. The Congressional Committee discovered that Marcello's private investigator, David Ferry, had known Oswald for years and was with him in the summer of 1963. Other associations uncovered. Charles Dutz Moret, a New Orleans bookie, was Oswald's uncle. He and Oswald's mother, Marguerite, were part of the crowd in which Marcello moved. Then there's Marcello associate Nofia Pecora. He bailed Oswald out of jail after a fight three months before the assassination. Pecora was in phone contact with Jack Ruby at about the same time. What we, what we can conclude from this is that organized crime knew about Oswald, knew a lot about Oswald, and, and, and probably would, were in a position to select him as someone who might uh, uh, shoot the president and and, uh, and give them a way of carrying out a conspiracy uh, and make it look like he was uh, on his own. Strange friendships in New Orleans and an even murkier past in the American military. As a Marine, Oswald had served at a top secret U-2 base at Atsugi, Japan. He suddenly left the Marine Corps and defected to the Soviet Union at about the same time naval intelligence was running a secret program to spy on the Soviets. Americans were encouraged to defect, marry a Russian, spend a few years in the Soviet Union, and then return to the U.S. The ease with which Oswald was allowed to return home has always raised questions about whom he was really working for. Let me take that... The military man who served as liaison with the CIA during those years is Colonel Fletcher Prouty. For instance, it was a function of my own office to pull the man's military records, duplicate them as civilian records, and then duplicate them again as CIA records. Any change in his career with respect to the CIA, we would correct those records. But if that brought about a change in his military records, we would change those. We called the pro process sheep dipping. We, we corrected all the records so that his life would continue wherever he was working. Now, in the case of Lee Harvey Oswald, he was in a unit, a Marine unit, which was tied up with the U-2 program with CIA activities. His uh, relief from active duty, as you'll recall, is something that happened in a few hours one day. Well, I don't think that was a normal change. I think that was another one of these sheep dipping operations. I do request uh, for someone to come forward. Whatever the color of sheep Oswald really was, Lawyer Bernard Fensterwald believes several government agencies knew a great deal about the man and for whatever reason, perhaps to hide their own incompetence, are still keeping much about him secret. So somebody here knows. Somebody oh, up in Oswald certain, knows. I'm certain that they know. I think they knew within a matter of days of the murder what it was about. Why would they want to cover it up? I think each agency involved had its own reasons. Uh, I mean. I think you can imagine the consternation at CIA headquarters on the day of the murder when it came over the wire that uh, they picked up Lee Harvey Oswald as a suspect and they punched the button on their computer and a stack of paper about this how and see on Lee Harvey Oswald comes buzzing out. Now, which of the U.S. agencies he worked for, I'm not certain. I suspect it was Naval Intelligence and they conveniently burned all of their files. While we could not be expected to hide our sympathies, we made it repeatedly clear that the armed forces of this country would not intervene in any way. The intelligence agencies were up to their necks in the disastrous Bay of Pigs invasion of Cuba.
sponsored by the CIA in 1961. Kennedy's handling of the debacle enraged many American military leaders who thought the president had cold feet. I have decided in the last 24 hours to discuss briefly at this time the recent events in Cuba. Then when Khrushchev planted missiles in Cuba, Kennedy had a showdown with both the Soviet leader and his own military. The Joint Chiefs of Staff wanted a Grenada-style invasion of Cuba, but Kennedy opted for a naval blockade instead. Khrushchev wrote in his memoirs that the president made clear to him that he feared his own American military would turn on him if he backed off in any way. As the world went to the brink of nuclear war, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff recommended to Kennedy that Cuba be bombed. General Maxwell Taylor still stands by that position. So the chiefs recommended an attack on all the missiles without warning. So we could get those that were still there and really give a jolt to Khrushchev. Historian Arthur Schlesinger was a Kennedy aide. He describes the U.S. military reaction when the Russians backed down. Some of them were quite disappointed uh, when Khrushchev and the peaceful settlement came about. And uh, it was in the course of this situation that Kennedy remarked uh, rather bitterly, bitterly, understandably, he said, it's perfectly all right for the generals to give us this kind of advice. None of us will be around if we take it. I think that anybody who watches, looks at the fatality list on atomic weapons and realizes that the communists have a completely twisted view of the United States and that we don't comprehend them, that's what makes life in the 60s uh, as it is. We shall not regret that we have made this clear and honorable national commitment to the cause of man's survival. Haunted by a briefing which showed 300 million people would die in the first day of a nuclear war, Kennedy, two months before the assassination, braved the Hawks and signed a test ban treaty with the Soviets. He was opposed all the way by the Joint Chiefs of Staff. With our courage and understanding enlarged by this achievement, let us press onward in quest of man's essential desire for peace. As President of the United States, and with the advice and consent of the Senate, I now sign the instruments of ratification of this treaty. Those who feared Kennedy was soft on communism were also worried about his overtures to Castro through the president's personal emissary, William Atwood. Atwood's peace feelers had gone out just before the assassination, and Kennedy had been watching closely. And that was the, uh, uh, the week before the president went to Dallas, and so I was to see him right after uh, the Dallas trip. And of course, as we know, he never came back from Dallas. Despite the crowds here that day, Kennedy was not popular in Dallas. And for all his political enemies here, there were even more powerful ones waiting for him back in Washington, particularly among the military. He had pulled 800 American military advisors out of Laos and was preparing to do the same thing in Vietnam. When the House Assassinations Committee was set up, Congressman invited Peter Dale Scott to be a consultant. The former Canadian diplomat, now a professor in San Francisco, had become a leading critic of the Warren Commission. Scott studied the Pentagon Papers for clues on how Vietnam might be linked to the assassination. I think you're still holding for me volumes 3, 9, and 17 of the Dallas Police Department file. This wasn't a street crime to be solved by the Dallas police. This was a political crime with political consequences. Even in the sphere of foreign politics, where we've been told that there was no shift of policy between Kennedy and Johnson, in some areas that just wasn't true. President Kennedy, in the last six months of 63, was moving towards detente both in Cuba and in Vietnam, and in both areas, his peace initiatives were frustrated by his assassination. In the case of Vietnam, he had announced publicly on November 20th, 1963, just two days before his death, that there would be a withdrawal of U.S. troops from Vietnam, a thousand troops is the first stage of a major withdrawal. And I was horrified to learn that two days after his death, on November 24th, this first step towards disengagement in Vietnam was secretly canceled by the new Johnson administration. Colonel Prouty, former CIA liaison. There were all kinds of pressures. If you analyze that year, 1963, you can see that there were 
major forces uh, in combat with each other at that period. There was a lot of power that differed with the policies of President Kennedy. Seven Days in May is a book Jack Kennedy wanted made into a movie. He even had his press secretary call director John Frankenheimer to ask him to do it. The president took the extraordinary step of giving the White House over to Frankenheimer for use as a set. The story is about a military coup in the United States, and the villain is the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, played by Burt Lancaster. The confrontation is with the president over a treaty banning nuclear arms. I know you think I'm a weak sister, General, but when it comes to my oath of office, Defending the Constitution of the Somebody United States. Somebody has to States. teach me how to salute a flag. Somebody has to teach you about the democratic processes that that flag represents. But don't you presume to take on that job, Mr. President? Because, frankly, you're not qualified. Your course of action in the past year has bordered on criminal negligence. This treaty with the Russians is a violation of any concept of security. You're not a weak sister, Mr. President. You're a criminally weak sister. Arthur Schlesinger says Kennedy wanted the movie made as a lesson to the country. He never saw it. He made the trip through Dealey Plaza before it was released. Despite indications that Kennedy was killed in a crossfire there, what many courts regard as the crucial clue told a different story. The best evidence in any murder case is the body. And from the examination of Kennedy's wounds at the autopsy, it appeared clear that he had been killed by a single shot fired from the Texas School Book Depository. But then one critic, asked the unthinkable question. Had somebody tampered with the body? The doctors who tried to save Kennedy at Parkland Memorial Hospital in Dallas gave a briefing to reporters after he was pronounced dead. They said he'd been shot from the front. But the report of the autopsy, done back in Washington 12 hours later, apparently showed a different set of wounds. This apparent discrepancy in the description of the wounds was discovered by author David Lifton. In Dallas, the bullet came from the front. In Bethesda, from behind. Looking for answers, Lifton found a report from two FBI agents who were at the autopsy in Bethesda. From the doctor's commentary, the agents wrote that it was also apparent that a tracheotomy had been performed, as well as surgery of the head area, namely in the top of the skull. The Dallas doctors had indeed performed a tracheotomy, but they had performed no surgery of the head. After the president was pronounced dead here at Parkland Memorial Hospital, his body was wrapped in a white sheet and placed in a $4,000 bronze ceremonial casket for the trip back to Washington. Yet, according to three witnesses, who were sworn to secrecy under threat of court-martial, what arrived at Bethesda Naval Hospital in Washington was decidedly different. Dennis David was on duty at Bethesda when the body arrived. And we offloaded a casket and it was carried into the autopsy room. Uh, this casket is a plain gray box, if you will, metal box. Anybody that's ever been in Vietnam would know what I'm talking about. We shipped about hundreds of bodies out of there in the same type of casket. It's just a plain shipping casket. It was a very plain casket, and when I say... Retired police officer Paul O'Connor was a medical technician in the autopsy room in Bethesda. There was nothing fancy about it as far as being bronze. Uh, it wasn't bronze. After the special secrecy order was lifted in 1978, David Lifton tracked down the people who had helped transport the president's body. Donald Rebentish, now in Grand Rapids, Michigan, was a naval officer on duty that night. He unloaded what he was told was Kennedy's coffin from a black hearse at the back of Bethesda. These are pictures of the coffin, the, the pictures we all saw that night. There's the coffin being loaded in Dallas. Was that the coffin that you brought into Bethesda Hospital? No, that, it definitely wasn't that coffin. It wasn't the bronze coffin, and it wasn't the gray Navy ambulance shown here, says Rebentesh. But perhaps there's a simple explanation. The ambulance and coffin out front might have been decoys for security purposes. But if so, that was hidden from the Warren Commission, the House Committee, and even the FBI. The FBI filed a very detailed report about how two agents went out to meet the plane and follow the ambulance containing the casket, which they believe contains the body, 
and their report is very detailed, and they describe how they followed the Navy ambulance, which, as far as the FBI is concerned, had the body of President Kennedy. So the representatives of the Justice Department certainly knew of no security measures. And uh, I interviewed President Kennedy's senior military aide, General Chester Clifton, and he emphatically stated there were no decoys used. So it's not only something that's been overlooked, it's something that's been denied. Absolutely. So if it did happen... It's not a matter of record. And what conclusion does that lead you to? Well, my own conclusion, based on the sequence of events, is that the body was in the casket that Don Reventish saw offloaded and that others saw offloaded there, and that the casket that was accompanied by Jacqueline Kennedy and Robert Kennedy was empty. At the end of this hall at Bethesda Hospital, the autopsy began. The president's body had left Dallas lying on a sheet, but when the cheap metal casket was opened, that's not what medical technician Paul O'Connor found. We opened the whole casket up and there was a gray body bag, zip, yeah. zip shut. We unzipped the body bag and the president's body was lifted out of the, of the body bag. Uh, it's completely naked except for a sheet wrapped around his head, a bloody sheet. Aubrey Reich, now a Texas police sergeant, closed the coffin in Dallas. You didn't use a body bag for the no, president? No, sir. No way. Absolutely no question about that? No way. How can you be certain? I was there. And I, you remember? I remember picking him up, huh? I was the one that, that had the blood on my shirt and everything from the, the body. Well, between Parkland and Bethesda, he was placed in a body bag. Uh, everybody remembers where they were on November 22nd, and everybody has what the psychologist uh, Maslow calls a peak experience about that day. And uh, there are people whose peak experience had to do with looking at the wounds, or as in the case of medical technician Paul O'Connor, opening the casket which had the body and finding the body in a body bag. And uh, Don Revenchish's recollection has to do with the business of the body arriving, or the casket arriving, or a casket arriving in a black unmarked hearse. And I think it's critical because I think this kind of recollection is powerful. I think it's reliable, and uh, it's not a matter of... Uh, and they're all innocent enough things that that the individuals don't put together oh, themselves as being in any way unusual. That's very important to know that the people who know about two caskets uh, do not know that anything is particularly wrong with that because they're told that night here it's a security measure and uh, you cannot overemphasize the fact that the military often has uh, decoys. Two ambulances, two caskets, different wrappings on the body, and security measures unknown to the FBI and the president's chief military aide. But if people did have access to the body, what did they do? In Dallas, the doctors reported that most of Kennedy's brain was still in place. But Paul O'Connor describes the scene at Bethesda as they removed the president from the body bag and unwrapped the sheet from around his head. We got the last part of the sheet off. There was a, just a gasp for the room. And I looked down and I said to myself, my God, there's no brain. It's all gone. The man in the white coat was the x-ray technician that night in Bethesda. His name is Gerald Custer, and he's now an x-ray technician in Pittsburgh. I could fit both of my hands right inside the skull cavity. And like I had mentioned, that uh, I brought my hands back and there were still little pieces of uh, brain stem, or brain cells that I had to take off my hands. And there was no blood on it. Author David Lifton told O'Connor of the final autopsy report on an almost complete brain. Well, I don't know where they got it from. Uh, it surely wasn't the president's. Consider the pattern of contradictions. The body left Dallas with a small head wound, about 35 square centimeters, and arrived in Bethesda with a wound four times as large, almost 170 square centimeters. The body left Dallas with a brain, and according to these witnesses, arrived at Bethesda without a brain. The body left Dallas wrapped in sheets, and arrived at Bethesda in a zippered body bag. The body left Dallas in a ceremonial casket, and arrived at Bethesda in a cheap shipping casket. There's a tension between the irrefutable and the inconceivable. I mean, you don't alter a body. You don't mess with dead people. Uh, dead bodies, and certainly not a president's body. And on the other hand, there's evidence of all these different uh, activities occurring. Lifton's thesis. Between the Dallas shooting and the Bethesda autopsy six hours later, President Kennedy's body was secretly removed from the casket. It was then surgically changed. Wounds were altered. 
bullets were removed. The body was returned in time for the autopsy, returned as a medical forgery, which told a false story of the shooting. If it was planned, it's an awfully dicey plan, <laughs> that, that you were going to steal the body out from under the nose of the widow. Well, uh, this brings us to another area. It's my personal belief, and uh, there's lots of material I did not publish, that this was not the way it was supposed to happen, that the body was never supposed to be stolen on, uh, on Air Force One. It was never supposed to be altered on the East Coast, that something else was planned and that something went wrong. And we're looking at uh, a rather bungled scenario here. Otherwise, these witnesses wouldn't exist. Lipton speculates that in Washington, while all the attention was focused on the left rear door of the plane, the body was actually taken out the front door on the other side and put aboard the helicopter flapping in the background. It took off almost immediately. Half an hour after landing in Washington, Lipton says the wounds could have been altered to show that the fatal shot could only have come from Oswald's gun. Uh, I have postulated that the body may have been brought to Walter Reed Army Medical Center and there would be about 30 minutes with the body. And then they could have whisked it on to Bethesda farther down the road. That's correct, yeah. Could you do that work on the body, which you allege, in 30 minutes? Oh, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's very, I mean, from the standpoint of the evidence, it's not, it's very sloppily done. I mean, someone simply removed the brain and enlarged the wound. There'd be time to do that. What about the hideous ideas that it might have been an inside job, even going so far as altering the body to cover it up? I don't buy them. Richard Billings think... from the House Committee. I don't think that the, 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 the... I think it's, it's, it's hideous, as you say. It's hard to uh, believe that there were members of the government who, uh, who, who would undertake such a thing. But more than that, that that's, may sound naive, but, but, but when I see those theories written out and I study them and analyze them, I find them impossible to believe, the switching of the body. The, the, the switching of the body depends on, a, on, on someone creating a wound in the back of the head, with a, a wound that, that uh, appears to be a gunshot wound. Well, we, as I said before, uh, some of the very best uh, forensic pathologist advising us, and I've talked to the, 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 the chief one of those, fellow named Mike Bodden in New York, and, and, uh, and he gave me convincing reasons to believe that that wound in the back of the president's head could only have been created uh, by a bullet. And that sort of, to me, blows up that theory, and I think these outlandish theories do nothing more than, than take your eye off the ball. How do you dismiss, in, in that particular theory, the witnesses who say the coffins were different? That's his evidence. I can only uh, say they, they must have been mistaken. I know. I was there. I saw it. There's no doubt in my mind. Now, what, their reasons for not saying this now, I don't know. I, don't, I, can't, I can't crawl inside their head to find out. But I know that there were two caskets. And I know that the body was, that the first casket we offloaded that we later were told was the one with Kennedy was a shipping casket. It was not the formal casket that you showed me in these pictures earlier. Uh, why people persist, you know, that's what, I don't understand. Why can't they bring this stuff out? Why can't they make it public to the people and let the people see it? Why do they have to hide it? I, I don't understand it. Even 20 years later, I don't understand it. I suspect there are a lot of people who will say, the poor man is dead. It's a terrible tragedy. Does it really matter now whether it was just Lee Harvey Oswald or whether there were two Lee Harvey Oswalds? Well, I think it matters a lot uh, because if the president uh, was removed from office as a result of a quirk of fate, we're dealing with a situation that sometimes happens in life. We lose a loved one, whatever. But if in this particular case there was a plan to remove Kennedy from office, then it's a political event. There's no other conclusion, if one believes the evidence along the way in your book, that John Kennedy was killed by his own military. I don't think that's necessarily true. I would say that the, we do not know who are the architects of this plan. Uh, it could be people in the military, it could be people in the intelligence community, but it, the point is, at some point, some group of people had to sit down at a table and say, Jack's a nice guy, but he's got to go. How are we going to do this as painless as possible for the country? If there was a conspiracy, a lot of people would have to know. What I find inconceivable is that somebody would not have talked. It seems to me that without 
the forces of prosecution without someone directing an investigation at this question, there is not going to be people coming forward. No one has any reason to come forward because there's no self-preservation involved and no one's going to confess to a crime. Lawyer Bernard Fensterwald, the Kennedy classmate. If there was any kind of a conspiracy, surely in 20 years somebody would have talked. There is a great deal of pretty irreputable evidence that people who appear to be on the brink of talking uh, never live to do so. Now, I know there's a lot of, of uh, speculation and loose thought, but there have also been a lot of murders. And a lot of them you cannot blame on suicide or accident or anything else. For example, uh, the number three man in the FBI, a man named William Sullivan, who was in charge of this case for the FBI, uh, got crosswise some way and got retired early. And he was under subpoena by the House Assassinations Committee. And a few days before he was to appear, he walked out on his back porch and was shot through the head by a deer hunter. Within a matter of weeks, a man by the name of George de Morinschild, who was one of the key witnesses under subpoena, uh, either was killed or blew his own brains out in Palm Beach, Florida. Uh, two mafia people who were under subpoena both came to an unfortunate end. All of this while they were all under subpoena by the House of Representatives. Well, there and are... nobody's looked into those cases. There are coincidences, you know. Well, but four key witnesses before a congressional committee getting murdered before they can testify strikes me as more than a coincidence. Why, beyond it being a mystery that interests all of us, obviously, why do you believe this has to be pursued? I think that the standing of the American government vis-a-vis -vis the American people has suffered very badly uh, because of this case. Eighty percent of the public to this day still think that the government's lying about this. And I think that that causes a great deal of uh, uh, insecurity, uh, lack of faith in the government. I think things that can be straightened out. But I think we're going to have to solve this and maybe other cases before that happens. You're in the murky field of intelligence here. I mean, everywhere you look, you run into intelligence. And there's a great distrust in this country of the intelligence agencies. And I think a lot of it stems from this case. Thank you for joining us for such a serious subject on such a festive night. Next week, the Fifth Estate will be back with the regular format. In the meantime, on behalf of Bob McEwen, Hannah Gardner, and all of us here at the Fifth Estate, have a happy new year. And will, to the best of your ability, and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God.